Hi, I'm currently traveling around the world. My trip originated in Bangkok, where I live, and then traveled to New York to visit my family, and eventually on to Chicago and then the west coast of the United States, flying from there to Manila in the Philippines before I go back to Bangkok. And the part of the journey that I was very excited about, looking forward to, was the journey from Chicago to Emeryville, California. That's a suburb of San Francisco, riding on Amtrak's California Zephyr. It was going to be the highlight of the trip for me. Like many who ride that train route, the California Zephyr, I was excited about traveling by train through the Rocky Mountains and then later on through the Sierra Nevada Mountains and Donner Pass during the winter. I was really looking forward to that part of the trip. I was also very much influenced by a YouTuber, a gentleman by the name of Jeb Brooks, who makes really, really good videos. His reviews of Amtrak have received over a million views. And, you know, deservedly so. He's well-informed, very articulate, puts a lot of effort into making good videos. Jeb is also a train buff. I think he let his love of trains interfere with his objectivity. For the boarding process at Union Station in Chicago, an Amtrak employee escorts the passengers who are waiting for the California Zephyr from a lounge in the, in the station down into, uh, into the platform area where you board the train. And I was thinking back to Jeb's video as I was on that queue, that line going, going into, the, into the platform area, about how Jeb was talking about that experience of being very exciting and how I'm so excited to be getting on the train and anticipating all that's coming. And I'm walking through there saying, this looks like a very dark, poorly lit, grimy tunnel, which is exactly what it was. Then my first encounter with an Amtrak employee, a little bit of foreshadow of things to come, I suppose, uh, he, uh, he was the guy who scans your ticket before they let you go further down the platform. And he scanned my QR code and looked at me and says, have you changed your itinerary? And I'm like, no, it's, I made it nearly a year ago and haven't touched it since. Okay, let me figure out what's going on. And he checked everybody else in and made me wait while well, he checked them in. And then he had to go find out what it was that was going on with my ticket. And it turns out I didn't change anything they did. They changed me from one car to another without telling me or explaining why. Minor issue. And the wait wasn't really that much of a problem because the train was almost an hour late pulling out of the terminal. <laughs> we had plenty of time. They had a mechanical issue. But eventually we started moving and uh, I was on my way. The journey had begun, and as we moved through the Chicago suburbs, which seemed rather pleasant, actually, they looked like very upscale, very nice suburban area, and uh, we quickly passed through them into the central plains of North America. As the train rolled along and the sun went down, it was time for me to go to uh, have my dinner, my first dinner uh, on this experience, and Again, you know, the YouTubers, not only Jeb, but a few other YouTubers who have talked about uh, the meals that are presented that are included with the, with the fare for the uh, sleeper car passengers, they, they spoke pretty highly of the food. I mean, and they rave about it, but it's all pretty good and not bad and look how nice it looks and they'd show you pictures of it and that kind of thing. And it does look nice. The presentation of the food was good. You know, they put it together kind of nice, but the quality of food was not good. First night, I ordered what they call a signature steak. It didn't come the way I'd asked for it. I asked it well done. It was more medium. It was good enough. But it was covered in a sauce that wasn't mentioned on the menu because if they had mentioned it, I would have told them not to put it on because most of those sauces have sugar on them. And I avoid sugar. And it was really, really salty as I was eating and I began to figure out what this food is and the rest of the meals, you know, bore this out. They're pre-prepared food, much like airline food that they, you know, deliver to the, uh, to the Amtrak staff who heat them up and then present them and add a few little garnishes and bits and whatever and present it to you. 
it's processed food. It's highly processed food uh, with a lot of preservatives, mostly salt, I would guess, from the taste of it. All the stuff that I seek to avoid for a very good reason. And another thing that bore this out, I ordered the mac and cheese at one of the one of the meals, macaroni and cheese. It was crunchy. I don't know any recipe for macaroni and cheese that results in crunchy macaroni. This stuff was not the freshest food on the planet. I am predisposed to gout. Gout is a rather painful form of acute arthritis that is related to diet. It's something I've been dealing with for over 10 years, and I'm pretty good at managing it. Like I said, it's related to diet. I need to take a little responsibility for that. I could have prepared better for being sequestered on a three-day train ride and brought a little of my own roughage, I suppose. But I thought the quality of food was going to be better than it was, mostly because of Jeb's video. You know, I, I, I thought I was going to be dealing with more, the healthy choices that they had. They had vegan options and vegetarian options, which were, again, just highly processed stuff. Processed food triggers my gap. Again, I got a little responsibility here. It's not all on Amtrak, but the food was crappy. It triggered my gap. My right ankle swelled up. There's something that I can do on a train that I cannot do on an airplane very well. And that's sleep. There's something about the, the, the gentle rocking back and forth of the train and the clitic clatter of the wheels beneath that you can almost not hear. It just, just gently lulls me to sleep. I've, uh, it's one of the reasons I would take trains from Bangkok to Chiang Mai uh, at times, because I'd get a good night's sleep on them, or a fairly good night's sleep anyway. That didn't happen across the plains as uh, we rolled out into the central plains of the United States of America and the sun went down. I snuggled into my bed and prepared to sleep and enjoy the rocking back and forth of the train. The train was traveling at over 70 miles an hour. There were apps you could use to figure that out. And it was going between 70 and 75 miles an hour, nice clip. And, you know, it'd be rocking back and forth and the clitter clatter of the wheels and the whole nice train thing and then BAM! Okay, that clip was overkill. But the tracks that we were riding on, I figured that out because when I got to the West Coast and the train was going just as fast, it was much smoother and less noisy. The tracks there, which are heavily used for freight trains as well, I suppose, are just n not what they should be. And, and and there were parts of the ride where the train would rock back and forth with such violence it would slam up against whatever, you know, limits it had with a thud and a loud noise. And I didn't feel dangerous, but it woke me up like four or five times. Okay, so much for that. But I did get managed to get a little bit of sleep, and I was awake at dawn, which turned out to be a nice thing. I, I got to the observation car, and I brought my camera and took a few shots of a gorgeous sunrise coming up over the plains behind us. As we rolled into Denver to prepare for one of the most spectacular parts of the whole trip, the ride up into the Rocky Mountains. A lot more passengers board the train in Denver for, for, for this part of the trip. Because as we pull out of Denver, what they do there is they put on another engine to help pull the train up into the mountains. And you ride along, uh, the climate changes, the altitude changes as you slowly go up through these long switchbacks and through many, many different tunnels, passing at first, you know, uh, hillside farmland and then into Rocky Mountains and it is spectacular and you find yourself up at the top of the mountains in a snowy winter wonderland and the first stop in the mountains is uh, Winter Park, Colorado. This trip started out on the East Coast, drove two days, over two days to get to Chicago and now here we are 
up in the Rocky Mountains. There's a ski resort nearby there. A lot of the people that get on in ben Denver were just going up to the ski area. And with that, a train conductor came into the center of the observation car and he was a, a friendly guy. I, I want to again mention that the, uh, if I haven't done it already, that the staff, the car attendants, the wait staff, the conductors were all excellent. They worked real hard. They did the best they could to take care of the passengers on this rickety old rail line. And it's part of the problem. A lot of the equipment is really, really old, like the sleeping car that I was in. They're just old, you know, and uh, they have issues. They have age issues like me. Uh, the staff does their best to deal with these problems as that they're presenting. But here is this guy, this kind of this big old boy standing in the middle of the train car telling everybody they got to leave because uh, what it is, we've come up into the mountains now and you've had your turn in the observation car and there are more people on the train that, than, than can be accommodated in the observation car. So when they get to Winter Park, they ask everybody who's been there for the ride up into the mountains to exit the observation car to make room for other passengers who want to enjoy it as we ride through the elevated part of the Rockies. What the fuck, Amtrak? You know, you promote this train as a sightseeing adventure. And most everybody who gets on the damn train is doing it because they're like me. They want to see the scenery and take pictures. Another thing, you can wash the frickin' windows on the observation car. They're adequate to look at it. But if you want to take a picture with any kind of camera, you know, it's not going to come out well because the windows haven't been washed in forever. Uh, another management issue, I would say. You know, so this, I actually felt bad for the conductor. He seemed like a good guy. He was only doing his job. He seemed a bit embarrassed to have to tell people, but that didn't stop him from trying to shame people into it, kind of embarrass you, you know, like, you know, we have to, you know, you have to, you know, be kind to your fellow passengers, you know, lines like that. And I'm like, that, you know, it's not my problem. That's your problem. You're trying to make your problem my problem, but I got up and left anyway. I was kind of done on it. I got all the pictures I wanted to take. And, uh, you know, I could still see things out the window of my sleeping car, although it was on a lower level and it didn't have as good a perspective. And when I got back to my sleeping car, I found out that the toilets were broken. There were three or four toilets in my car and they have those flushing systems that you see on an airplane, those vacuum flush kind of things. Well, it wasn't working and they had to shut the toilets down on my car. No problem. They said, you could just go up the stairway here to the second floor and then, you know, go on to the car one way, either one of the adjoining cars back down the stairs to use the toilets on the adjoining car. And again, no problem. Yeah, unless you have gout and you're 73 and you have to get up like two or three times a night to go pee, then, then it's more than just an inconvenience. It's a real freaking problem. So thanks for that. Another thing about the, uh, the facilities, there are shower facilities as well that are available to the sleeping car passengers, and they do provide you with clean towels and soap. Uh, but what they didn't provide for in my car is, you know, hot water. It was tepid. It was barely off coast, somewhere between cold and warm. Now, guess what? For me, that's not a huge problem. I'm, I used to do hot yoga. I would take cold showers frequently. So my body is used to, you know, getting under a shower head that's spewing out cool water. Most people would freak right the hell out and jump out of the damn thing. I did manage to get my daily showers in, but uh, I don't know if the other cars had warmer water or not, but mine didn't. You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> They're old cars. Everything is old there. My, my sleeping room, I don't want to call it tattered. That wouldn't be true. And they did try to keep it as clean as possible, but it was just old. The upholstery was old and kind of grimy looking, and the, and the carpets uh, had seen better days. It's old stuff, this Amtrak equipment. During one of my long nighttime walks up and down the two stairways and along the rocking narrow hallway, I was using my hands against the wall to balance because of my, you know, poor walking abilities. And I encountered, you know, I was touching things. So I noticed that they had these little hand sanitizers placed in a bunch of places along the route that I was walking. I guess that's a vestige of the COVID stuff. They just left them there. So I decided, you know, I'm touching a lot of stuff. Let's, you know, sanitize my hands. So I squirted a little bit on, rubbed it on my hands. 
I got a chemical burn. It was loaded with alcohol. That wasn't a terrible case, but it was like a first degree chemical burn. It was like, you know, I, I have sensitive skin, but there's just too much alcohol in it. And I know what a chemical burn looks like from my fireman days. And that's exactly what it was. It was like a, a minor first degree chemical burn from the goddamn hand sanitizer. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I probably killed the germs though. <laughs> Amtrak does not put a lot of focus on customer comfort, on passenger comfort. That's clear by the way they manage this fucked up railway. It's, you know, they, they're focused on something else, and I'm not quite sure what it is, but, you know, just little incidences like that. But yet, hey, you know, I had the Sierra Nevada mountains in front of me, going to be the best part of the trip. We're going to go up into the Sierra Nevada mountains and pass through Donna Pass. During the winter time, I was looking forward to it. We rolled into Reno, Nevada and sat there for nearly three hours while Amtrak decided whether it was safe enough to go up into the mountains or not. It was snowing in the mountains. It had been snowing for several hours and nearly a day and it was bad weather all up and down the west coast at that point and it was snow in the uh in the sierra nevada mountains so i understand that you need to be careful understandable it, we had been on that railway for you know like two days now headed toward that point that reno ne reno nevada train station and it had been snowing for nearly 24 hours now you know, a little pre-planning would have went a long way here. You know, I understand you have safety issues. I guess their, uh, their choice was, do they send the train back to Chicago without going through the mountains? But then they have to, you know, deal with all the passengers. They'll have to put us up at a hotel for the evening and give us alternate plans, maybe put us on another train. You know, I, I realize it's a logistical nightmare for whoever has to deal with that. But you had hours and hours, days to deal with it. You knew it was coming. A little pre-planning went a long way there. I was considering jumping off the train in Reno and flying down to L.A., where I am now. I'm in L.A. near the airport. I expect it to be in Manila by now, but, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, but, you know, an employee, just as I was about to abandon the train, one of the employees says, hey, we just got word we're going to be moving forward. Oh, great. I get back on the train. We pull out of Reno. We're traveling for a very short period of time, less than a half an hour. And the train comes to another stop. And we sit there for yet another couple of hours on the side of the track going up into the Sierra Nevada mountains. You know, and they don't even tell you what's going on. Well, we eventually found out that we're waiting for a snowplow. There's a, you know, a train, I guess, that has some kind of apparatus on the front of it that pushes the snow out of the way. And we were waiting for that for hours. Again, a little, didn't you know we were coming? Did you know it was snowing? Everybody in the train knew it was snowing. You know, it's like a little pre-planning there would have went a long way. Well, finally, we start moving up the mountain. And within five minutes, we're in Truckee for another stop. I was like, damn, if we were going to sit there, if we had to sit there for another two or three hours, could you not have brought us to the train station where we could have gone into the terminal and perhaps found a restaurant? You know, you know okay, you needed the track. Well, drop us off and move the train back to the side. You know, it's like it's just poor management on the side, on, on the part of Amtrak once again. Maybe that clip I showed you wasn't such overkill after all. <laughs> It was dark when we passed through the Sierra Nevada mountains. I never got to see the scenery. My 52-hour scheduled 52-hour train trip turned into a 63-hour train trip. It was near 3 a.m. when we finally full, pulled into Emeryville, California. My train trip turned into, you know, 11-hour delay, crappy food, non-working toilets, shitty tracks back in the plains and you know hand sanitizer that gave you chemical burns this is not the train trip that i expected it to be again jeb brooks i hate to be critical of him because i kind of like the guy he makes really really good videos he's a very charming guy but i think the problem is is he's just a train buff they can see no wrong and 
what I'm about to say didn't come from me. I was talking to the train staff. I told the train staff when I was making this video, I had planned to give it two and a half stars out of five. And one of them said, really, you're gonna give it that much? And no, I'm not, I'm gonna go down to our one star. The, 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 uh, and as I was talking to him, I learned they all know who Jeb Brooks is. Jeb Brooks, you know, over, you know, one million, almost one point something million viewers on, on his review of the uh, California Zephyr. I'm sure it was a, it was a great promotion for Amtrak, and all the staff knew who, who he was. <laughs> he says we call Jeff and guys like him foamers. Foamers? What's a, what's a foamer? So they foam at the mouth when they see a train. <laughs> That's a little harsh, <laughs> but he's a train buff, you know. And and I think it interfered with his uh, with his objectivity. So I'm presenting this to you for an alternate point of view. I think it sucked. Amtrak has already offered me a, a voucher, I think a $350 voucher, which is about half of what I paid. It's a little less than half of what I paid for the trip. And um, I'm not going to take it because I, I'm never going to get on Amtrak again. And I'm going to put this video or a sh shorter version of it on Twitter and uh, and tag Amtrak. And I'm going to see if I can. I'd like to get a refund, frankly. I think... Uh, I, I think I deserve one. So uh, sorry to put up such a you know negative kind of video, but hey, there it is. Thanks for watching.